Hi everyone, I'm Sylvia, a PhD student at the University of Toronto, and today I'm presenting a joint work with my amazing advisor, Alec Jacobson. Let's start with a simple question. Consider an oriented point cloud of a surface like this, and let's place an object like this car somewhere on the plane. The question is simple. Does this car intersect the surface described by this point cloud? Before we wrote this paper, the way that we would have answered this question, and perhaps the way that you would answer it too, is by using a surface reconstruction algorithm to convert this point cloud into a fully determined surface representation and then check if the car intersects with that surface. The most well-known surface reconstruction algorithm in computer graphics is Poisson surface reconstruction. Basically, this algorithm uses the point cloud to get a scalar field that is an implicit representation of the surface. This scalar field takes positive values outside the shape and negative values inside then the zero level set of this scalar field is the reconstructed surface. Our car does not intersect this reconstructed surface. So thanks to Poisson reconstruction, we can at least formulate an answer to this question. According to this algorithm by Kasten et al, the car does not intersect the surface. Now this is a bit of a scary conclusion to reach, right? Just by looking at the point cloud, it's intuitive that there are many shapes that the surface could take. Sure, it could be exactly like the Poisson reconstruction one, but it could also look like this, like this, like this, or even like this. Surface reconstruction is an underdetermined problem, so there's probably an infinite set of possible surfaces, and Poisson reconstruction by Kasten et al. is only considering one of them. In this work, we propose a way of formalizing this probabilistic view of surface reconstruction in order to give more complete answers to critical queries like this one. This will not just be useful for collision detection, but it will also aid us in other queries like ray casting, point cloud repair, or next view planning. We will achieve this by combining the Poisson reconstruction algorithm with insights from statistical learning theory, specifically with the concept of a Gaussian process. Let's start with the first one. Poisson reconstruction has been around for over 15 years now, and in my experience, most people working in geometry processing have a very clear understanding of how it works. But also in my experience, these understandings, all of them correct, can vary heavily from one researcher to the next. So I'm gonna ask you that if you've, if you've heard of Poisson reconstruction and you think you have a good idea of how it works, you put that idea aside for the next few minutes. I'm gonna tell you how I like to think of Poisson surface reconstruction. The input is an oriented point cloud which mathematically we can write as a set of points and vectors. From this point cloud, we start with an interpolation step, which defines a vector field for every point in space. Now this may seem like a lot of math, but in reality, all that this is doing is a weighted sum of the normal vectors in the point cloud. The weight of each vector will answer to this kernel function, which is higher the closer x is to a sample point and on a per point estimation of sample density. We usually write this equation in matrix form like this. Once we've defined this vector field, all that's left to do is to solve a Poisson equation. This is where the method's name comes from, to get a scalar field that is negative for points inside the shape and positive outside. Of all this process, this equation is the critical step I'd like you to focus on, since our major contribution will be showing that this step can be thought of as a Gaussian process. So let's move on to understanding what a Gaussian process is. To put it in a way that's trendy today, a Gaussian process is just one way of doing supervised learning. But let's look at what that actually means. Basically, it means that there's some function u of x that I don't know and I want to know. The first step of a Gaussian process is to come up with a prior. In a Gaussian process, this prior is given in the form of two functions, m and k, called the mean and the covariance functions. Then I observe some data. What the Gaussian process then does is it allows us to compute a posterior distribution. So what does u of x look like given the data that I've observed? So for any new sample point that I have not yet observed, I can ask what the mean of u is and what its variance is. And thanks to Gaussian processes, both of these quantities can be easily computed with some matrix multiplications. These k matrices are obtained by evaluating the covariance of the training and test points and the bold phase vector m is just by evaluating the m mean at the training and test points too. There are many Gaussian processes for many applications, but they all look roughly like this. 
They start by setting a prior, then observe some training data, and then compute the posterior distribution, which is a Gaussian with closed form mean and variance functions. One common simplification that's usually done in Gaussian processes is to assume that the mean is zero, which helps simplify this expression. Now, if you look at the expression for the mean and the variance here, it's immediate to see that the costly or even non-robust part of this calculation will be this matrix inversion or this linear system sum, where the matrix K has a size that is on the order of the whole training data. So one trick that we can pull off that we detail in the paper is we can lump it into a diagonal matrix. Finally, here we've considered a simple example where the function we want to learn is a scalar U. However, we can just as easily consider a vector-valued Gaussian process for a vector V. So this is where I wanted to get to, a vector-valued Gaussian process with a zero mean prior and lumped covariance matrices. Again, the most critical part of this is that, like I promised, we reached this equation for the mean of the Gaussian process. This equation is the same as the equation for the Poisson surface reconstruction vector field. This is our major contribution. We realize that the vector field described in Poisson surface reconstruction can also be seen as the mean of a Gaussian process. This lets us introduce our generalization of Poisson reconstruction, which we call stochastic Poisson surface reconstruction, where the input point cloud is no longer just a bunch of vectors. It's a set of samples from a random distribution. The interpolation step isn't just an interpolation. It's a Gaussian process with a given prior that lets us recover the whole Gaussian distribution that describes this vector field. In other words, for each point in the plane, it will not just be assigned one vector as in a traditional vector field. Instead, it will be assigned a full distribution of potential vectors, each of them with different probabilities. The same way that we solved the PDE in the space of functions before, we can solve it in the space of distributions. And we don't just get a scalar function, we get a whole posterior distribution for said scalar function. What does that mean? It means that for every point in the plane, we have a mean and a variance, which fully determine a Gaussian distribution of what the scalar field looks like at that point. This distribution is fully determined by this mean and this variance. And as we change the query point, the mean and variance also change. Points of the plane that are closer to data points will have smaller variances, resulting in more certain values. While points that are away from the data will have large variances, which lead to more uncertain distributions. This statistical formalism lets us compute important queries about different points in space. For example, we may want to compute this integral, which is nothing but the probability of the scalar field's value being below or equal to zero. But recall that in this Poisson reconstruction scalar field, being below zero just meant being inside the reconstructed object. So this quantity is the probability of any given point in space being inside the chain. We can plot this integral for every point to get something like this. While I'm showing a very simple 2D example, note that we can similarly compute these quantities for 3D example. Something we notice by looking at these probability functions is that it's easy to tell which ones represent shapes that we are more certain about and which ones don't. This is simple, right? If all the values are either 0 or 1, meaning that for every point in space I am either sure that it's on the shape or sure that it's outside the shape, then I am very certain of what the shape looks like. The more points there are, there are that are closer to 0.5 probability, the least certain I am. So inspired by this, we introduce this concept of integrated uncertainty, which just measures how far the probabilities are from 0 and 1. This integrated uncertainty decreases as we sample more and more points from a given shape surface. We think this concept can be very useful. For example, we may use it as a stopping criterion in scanning, given progressive scans of a shape, we can just wait until the integrated uncertainty is lower than some threshold amount. And that way we can be sure that we get surfaces of similar reconstruction quality. Another query that we can answer using this quantity is where does a ray intersect against the surface? Given that there's many possible surfaces, the ray collision distances will follow a statistical distribution, which we can compute. Consider, for example, this spatial. We simulate a point cloud scan of it. For this point cloud, we can place two hypothetical cameras. And if we compute the same probability map, we see that the spread of where the rays may hit the surface is wider for the camera aimed at the region with less data points 
that the camera directly aimed at the data. This is a very useful query, as we can actually combine it with the integrated uncertainty computation that we just introduced. For any given point cloud, we can place many hypothetical cameras around it. For each camera, we can simulate many rays and find the points at which they intersect the surface. Then we can ask, how much would the integrated uncertainty change if we added those points to the point cloud? This lets us score cameras by how useful they would be as the next scanning position. There are other statistical queries that we can ask. For example, we've seen how useful it is to compute a point's likelihood of being inside the shape. We can also compute this other quantity, which measures how likely it is to be on the surface of the shape. Plotted for every point in the plane, it looks something like this. This quantity is useful in cases like this one, where we have an incomplete point cloud of an object, and we can use the probabilities and sample according to them to sample new surface points and complete the point cloud. And you might be thinking, what about that car example that we motivated everything with? Well, another quantity that we can compute is regional probabilities. This is to say, given an input point cloud, we can not only ask about specific single dimension zero points in space, what their probability of being in the shape is, we can draw whole regions of space and ask what their probability of intersecting with the reconstructed shape is. We illustrate the usefulness of these regional probabilities in this example, where we construct a simple street scene that a car is traversing. Using our algorithm, it can scan its surroundings and find what its probability of crashing against other cars is along a proposed trajectory. Now, these are all new applications that our stochastic boson surface reconstruction makes possible, but they're not even the ones I'm most excited about. If you recall, our contribution was showing that Poisson reconstruction could be seen as a Gaussian process specifically with a zero mean prior. Now that we understand Poisson surface reconstruction in this new light, we can ask ourselves, can we do better than this zero mean prior? For example, a known problem with Poisson reconstruction is that it may produce open surfaces. In our paper, we show that changing the prior to that of a sphere, for example, can enforce closed surfaces in the reconstruction. This works beyond just simple 2D examples, like this apple, of which we simulate a point cloud scan. Poisson reconstruction produces an open reconstruction, but our algorithm returns a closed one. All right, an apple is still a pretty simple shape, even if a useful one in some uh, agricultural robotics applications, but even marginally more complex priors can work for more complex examples. For example, by adding a prior to a car reconstruction, we get a much closer reconstruction to the ground truth. We are excited for future work that may use our new understanding to incorporate more complex, task-specific learned priors to Poisson surface reconstruction. Another avenue for future work that we think can be very exciting is improving our algorithm's runtime. While computing the mean of our distribution can be done quite efficiently, computing the variance is very slow. In the paper, we show a space reduction trick that we pull off to at least make the step manageably slow. But just by looking at the shape of this variance, we see that these are simple functions. They can't be hard to approximate. And we hope that future work can learn to approximate or calculate these variances fast and use our work to provide the necessary statistical formalism. A question I get very often when talking about this project is, well, couldn't you just do this with a neural network? And I'll admit my understanding of neural networks is very limited, but lately I've been looking into these things called Bayesian neural networks or Bayesian inference in neural networks. They at least claim to produce a similar variance map to the one that we output. And I think replicating our work within the wider generality of Bayesian neural networks can give us both theoretical and practical gains. In our work, we combine a concept from geometry processing with Gaussian processes. Something I've also been thinking about for the past few months is what other aspects of the geometry processing pipeline can benefit from Gaussian processes. Here are some that came to mind, but if you ever do research with geometry, I encourage you to consider if there's any part of an algorithm that you use that can be broadly thought of as an interpolation. If so, you might be able to substitute it or reinterpret it with a Gaussian process and quantify the uncertainty of your computation. And going even further, be it with Gaussian processes or be it with neural networks or some other technique, I hope that this work can take us on the road to a fully uncertain geometry processing pipeline. There are already many works in geometry processing that quantify uncertainty. 
but these, like ours, are mostly limited to the capturing step, which makes sense since this is a step with the most clear source of error and the most obvious uncertainty. But I think a very promising avenue for future work is to carry that uncertainty all through the geometry processing pipeline in a way that can also provide feedback for the capture process. I realize that this vision seems a bit like science fiction right now, but I hope works like ours can slowly work towards making it a reality. With that, let me thank our sponsor, as well as my co-author and advisor, Alec Jacobson, and you all for listening to this talk.